This morning, our scripture reading <clears throat> are the familiar words of a, an amazing scene that occurred with Jesus and three of his disciples. It's called uh, the Transfiguration, and it's found in the 17th chapter of Matthew, the first eight verses. You'll find it on, beginning on page 18 in your pew Bible if you wish to read along. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the Beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. Once more this morning, may God add God's blessings and understanding to the reading and hearing of this portion of God's holy word. As many or most of you know, uh, in the last several weeks, uh, maybe I should say actually months, uh, the United Methodist Church has been in and out of the news. Uh, sometimes good news, sometimes not so good news. And it brought to, to mind one of the things that I believe about the United Methodist Church. You may have heard me say this before in a sermon or maybe in a Sunday school, but I, I believe that one of the greatest strengths of the United Methodist Church is we don't tell you what to believe. Uh, you may ask John or uh, uh, Georgia or myself or any other person on staff or any other member as far as that goes. And we'll tell you what we believe, but we won't tell you what you need to believe or should believe. Now that's a great strength because in so doing, uh, you are building the foundation of your own faith. You're not taking somebody else's word. You're not taking somebody else's faith and trying to appropriate it for yourself. No, uh, when you figure it out for yourself and do the thinking, the praying, the searching, the reading, then it is your faith. One of the greatest strengths, we don't tell you what to believe. One of the greatest weaknesses of the United Methodist Church is we don't tell you what to believe. And the reason I say that is we all know that today people want things instantly. They want the answers. They want the solutions. Uh, they want everything right now. They don't want to have to wait. A lot of people don't want to do the work of building their own faith. Tell me what to believe and I'll believe it. But what happens is when the storms of life come, when the challenges of life come, uh, their faith uh, just disappears, it disintegrates, because it's not their faith. They've been simply told. So this morning, I decided that I would uh, talk a little bit about our faith and about a healthy faith that hopefully all of us have. And in a checkup, I, I believe that's the, the title I gave uh, this morning. Uh, every one of us needs a checkup for our faith or something like that. And that comes from what I've been experiencing in the last few weeks and getting ready to experience in the next few weeks. Uh, I went to the eye doctor about three weeks ago, four weeks ago. I never knew you could do so many tests uh, to your eyes. But I sat in that chair for 45 minutes nonstop trying to read this, trying to see that. Uh, in about three weeks, I'm going to go have my, every six months, I, I go for a general physical uh, with my internist. Every three months, I go for a checkup on, on my teeth. 
and my gums and everything else in my mouth. So I thought, well, if, if, if we all have checkups for our eyes and our bodies and our teeth and our feet and on and on and on, how about a checkup for our faith? Well, what would a checkup for our faith be? Well, it would be answering, I think, just two or three questions, not many. For number one, we should ask ourselves, is our faith growing? Because a healthy faith continues to grow. It never stops growing. I once read that uh, a, a healthy thing grows. A growing thing evolves. I think all of us know what that, that, that first part, healthy things grow. Have you looked at your yard lately and your uh, flower beds? Uh, this time last year, I think, in spite of the drought we had last year, uh, I think our grass, uh, we watered it uh, uh, free more frequently than now, once a week. And, and our grass was growing. Our trees uh, were looking good. Our shrubs were growing. We had our yard cut just about every six days. Now I think I'm going to call the man and tell him to come every six weeks because the grass just isn't growing. It's not healthy looking. Neither are the shrubs. Neither are your trees and shrubs and grass. Healthy things grow. Growing things, uh, they evolve. They change. In other words, they don't stay static. Well, it should be that way for our faith as well. We should never reach the point where we say, good, that's it. I don't need to know anymore. Don't need to learn anymore. Don't need to grow anymore. Don't need to serve anymore. I know all that I need to know for right now. I stop the growth of my faith. No. We need to keep searching. We need to keep reaching. We need to keep growing in our faith. Let me give you a couple of personal examples for me. I, I don't know at what age. It, I might have been a, a late 20s, early 30s before I finally understood and accepted a passage of Scripture that I have heard maybe 500, 1,000 times. You've heard it 1,000 times yourself. Uh, the passage that reads uh, that God, uh, that all things uh, work out for good with uh, those who love God. All things work out for good with those who love God. Now, I didn't accept that because uh, so many bad things had happened to me. So many bad things that there was no way that all things work for good with those who love God. No way. And there were too many bad things going on around the world for that to be true. But I remember one morning, thankfully, after I had given up on that passage of Scripture and said uh, it's just wrong, maybe Paul was misquoted or maybe it was mistranslated. And I was eating breakfast with a wonderful gentleman and I just happened to mention that there was some scripture that I, I just couldn't accept. And he said, well, well what verse or what passage? And I, and I uh, uh, shared it with him. And he was so kind and gentle with me. And he said, I don't, think, I don't think you're reading or getting the truth correct on that. He said, it's not saying that everything that happens to you is good. What God is saying is, what Paul is saying is, that whatever happens, regardless of what happens, good or bad, positive or negative, that if you love God, God will somehow make something positive or make something good out of that. And then I started reflecting on my own life. And I saw that time and time again, I didn't recognize it, didn't realize it at the time, but something that had happened that, that wasn't good or was, didn't make me feel good or was bad or whatever you want to call it, but eventually, eventually it ended up teaching me something or showing me something in a positive way, in a good way, that made me a better person, a stronger person. And I wouldn't have ever have done that if it hadn't been for that one man who challenged me to don't stop right there where you are in that understanding. Grow, grow. Likewise, I had an experience with a woman. 
a wonderful woman who one day, just out of the blue, quoted a, a passage of Scripture I had never heard before. I thought I knew everything. And she said, the passage of Scripture that, that means so much to me is, is that God will not let us be tempted beyond which we can withstand with God's help. And I'll never forget because I immediately responded saying, well, that's not right. I said, I've given in to temptation many times in life. I, I, I try not to, but I, I've given in to temptation. And she said, all right, all of those times when you gave in to temptation, how many of those times did you ask for and seek God's help? Well, it didn't take me long to uh, reply, zero, zero. And she said, try it. Next time you are tempted and you feel like you're giving in, ask for God to help you, to give you strength, give, it, give you power. And I did. And I did. And I have. And I have. You see, our faith should never become static. We should never be completely satisfied and say, I don't have anything else I need to know or learn or experience. You know, in our passage, that's precisely what David wanted to do. He wanted to stay right there. He asked Jesus, said, it's good that we're here. You want me to build a, a three a, a huts, three shrines, three places where we can come and stay because this is such... Uh, was such an experience with you and Moses and Elijah. And Jesus eventually said, no, no. Jesus wanted Peter and James and John to experience God in a new way and in a different way, not just in that one way. So, if we want to have a healthy faith, one of the parts of the checkup should be, is our faith growing? Is it the same today as it was five months ago, five years ago, ten years ago? If it's the same, then maybe we need to do something because a healthy faith grows. Healthy things grow. Growing things evolve and change. A second thing about a, a healthy faith is that it's used all the time. A healthy faith works every day, not just on Sundays, not just two or three days a week, but day in and day out, a healthy faith is put to work. We live by faith day by day. I once heard Arthur uh, Moore, a retired bishop, I was at a, a seminar and he was one of the speakers. And Bishop Moore told about a man in, in Georgia the man had been away from his uh, hometown for 15 years. And upon his return, he went to the church where he was raised and where he was baptized and so forth. And it was a Sunday night service and they had um, testimonies or a time for testimonies. And so uh, when it, the service got to that point, he, he got up and he said, I, I've been away for 15 years. And he said, I know I left my wife and children behind. And he said, I know that, that I have embarrassed my parents over the last 15 years. He says, I know I've cheated and I've lied and I've even been put in jail in the last 15 years. But I'm here to testify that throughout all 15 years, I never lost my religion. Now, I don't know what kind of religion he was talking about, Maybe he was talking about what I think some people consider the Christian faith to be, and that's life insurance. It insures their life against going to hell, but that's not a healthy faith. To simply want to believe uh, in order to stay out of hell, no, no. A healthy faith is used day in and day out. A healthy faith is put to work. That's why we have faith, to work it to use it, to live by it. So a healthy faith, it works every day. And then finally, a, a, a third question to ask to see if we have healthy faith is, a healthy faith makes us more loving. A healthy faith makes us more loving each day. 
Jesus told his followers, which means he told you and he told me, he said, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Thereby all will know that you are my followers. Interesting. People will know that we're followers of Christ by the amount of love that we share and that we give. And it's not just to those in our family. It's not just to our friends and neighbors. It's to anybody and everybody. We might even say, especially towards strangers, to show love and to show kindness. What was it that song, or I guess it's the chorus of, of that song, that hymn that we sing sometimes, they'll know that we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. That's what Jesus was saying. Our healthy faith should make us more loving. Remember, Paul said, hey, even if, if, if I am able to speak in tongues, and even if I have all kinds of prophetic powers, and I'm able to do miraculous things, if I don't have any love, I am nothing, and I have nothing. Yes, a healthy faith makes us more loving. And don't you think our world needs more of that now? You remember the, the song, I guess it was maybe 40, 50, 60 years ago, Dionne Warwick, I believe. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. Written that many years ago, and yet how true is it today? And who's going to do the loving? Who's going to do the sharing? Who's going to do the caring? If it's not us, then I'm afraid it's not going to be. It's not going to happen. A healthy faith makes us more loving today than five months ago, than five years ago, than maybe even five weeks ago. So, you know what I've decided to do, and, and, and I'm going to be doing it, I guess, now in about three or four weeks when I go for my checkup, my general checkup? I've decided that whenever I go for any kind of checkup, I'm going to ask myself, either in the waiting room or driving to uh, the, the doctor's office or away from it, I'm going to give myself a, a, a checkup to see how healthy my faith is. You might want to try that. Just ask yourself two or three questions. Is my faith still growing? Is it being used every single day? Is it making me more loving? If we can answer yes to those questions, then we do have a healthy faith. Let's bow once more as we pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you that we even have the privilege of having the gift of faith. Help us, O oh God, to have a strong faith, have a vibrant faith, have a growing faith, and a healthy faith. For if indeed we have that, it will make this world a better place. Forgive us when we fail you and forgive us when we fail those around us, we pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.